Okay. Hello, hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It's a great pleasure and honor with Sebastian Geiger from TU Delft and myself, both from TU Delft, to host you again back after summer break to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar. Today we have the pleasure and honor to host our dear colleague, uh, Arnaud, Dr. Arnaud Reveille, uh, from Geostock in France. Uh, and thank you all, many of you who are actually connected online and watching us. It's, we, we missed you during the summer break, by the way. I forgot to mention, I believe Sebastian also did miss you all as well. So I introduce Arnold, and then we will have his uh, lecture. And then, like always, we get the questions at the end, uh, and then we'll have a discussion. Arnold holds, holds a PhD in geosciences from Sorbonne University in France. He has worked four years for four years as a research engineer at the French Geological Survey, known as BRGM, mostly on reservoir engineering questions related to CCS, for carbon dioxide uh, geological storage. He then joined Geostock in 2012 and worked on many industrial and R&D projects of underground storage of natural gas, compress, uh, and also hydrogen. He has been the innovation manager of Geostock and is since 2020 the head of the Net Zero Underground Storage Solutions. He is a member of the Solution Mining Research Institute, SMRI, a research committee, and is the coordinator of the European project called Histories and HI, would go a little bit like hydrogen storage, so it's Histories, European research project. So thank you very much, Arnold, for graciously accepting our invitation and uh, accepting to give this uh, lecture to the audience once more. Arnold's lecture would last for about half an hour, and then we will take the questions in the chat box and discuss, like always, do not wait until the end of the talk. Type any questions that you might have. Your question triggers other questions in the audience as well. And I'm sure Arnold would be very happy to receive plenty of questions and would never be offended by many questions like all of us. Arnold, we are all looking forward to hearing your lecture, please. Thanks a lot, uh, Hadi, for the introduction. Thanks a lot, Hadi and Sebastian, for this uh, invitation to this uh, webinar. It's, um, it's really a pleasure to me. And, um, and I'm, I'm very happy uh, to uh, be invited and in, in, in to this great and rare in our small geosciences world uh, webinar. So I will present you high stories. So it stands for high hydrogen storage in European subsurface. Um, and uh, the recent developments uh, we, uh, we work on and we brought uh, to this um, topic of hydrogen storage in, in subsurface. Um, so we we'll first uh, introduce you to the project. So our context, the context of the project is that, um, as you know, uh, the European Union has the ambition of being climate neutral by 2050. It's a very big uh, ambition. Uh, it has many implications and uh, it may require uh, changing our energy systems and many see hydrogen playing a big role uh, in this. And if hydrogen uh, plays a big role uh, in the energy system at the surface in our lives, uh, most likely we will need some uh, storage and massive storage for that. And so the scope of the project is one of the technologies uh, for massive storage of hydrogen, which is hydrogen storage in porous media, depleted fields and aquifers. This has never been done to date. And uh, part of high stories, the first leg of high stories, or first, first pillar of high stories, is to bring uh, technical developments um, on, this, uh, on this technology of uh, hydrogen storage in porous media. The other uh, part of high stories is focused on giving insights to decision makers, because uh, this kind of underground storages it, it is a massive uh, infrastructure, big infrastructures. Uh, it is um, connected to energy systems. It is something that makes that takes uh, decades to develop uh, most of the time. So uh, we need to plan ahead for that. Uh, so we will bring 
um, insights on the storage demand, uh, on the impacts, uh, social and environmental, um, that uh, have this, this technology. Um, so High Stories uh, is a project uh, uh, bringing together a consortium of uh, institutes or companies from 17 European countries. So it's quite large. Um, Geostock is coordinating it. And um, there are uh, seven partners. You see the logos here. And uh, you see also the, it corresponds to the, the blue dots uh, on the map. Um, one of the partners, uh, CO2 Geonet, is actually an association by law, and it gathers uh, most of European uh, research uh, research institutes uh, looking at in geosciences or or and uh, geological surveys, and uh, many 17 as well uh, of uh, of these uh, research institutes or uh, geological surveys are also participating through this association as what is called third parties. So you have the names and logos here on the left. Um, and um, we also have a group of uh, 13 uh, advisory board members, uh, mostly uh, storage operators uh, of storages in Porus Media. And um, I get to, uh, to the reason why uh, we needed such a large uh, number of third parties and such a, large, uh, such a big advisory board uh, in the project um, later in the presentation. So our project started in uh, January 2021. Uh, it will end in June 2023. And um, we're now um, after the first big half of the project. And I will uh, present you the results we had at, until this point. Um, and um, I will first try to explain you how the project is organized and, and what is uh, the overall goal of the project. So you find here again uh, our two pillars. I will start with the first one, which is uh, subsurface technology development. So here we are focused only on porous media. Um, so uh, we have a work package, uh, one uh, looking at um, uh, identifying traps, porous traps, that could be um, uh, suitable uh, for hydrogen underground storage at the European scale. And if we needed such a large number of geological surveys in the, in the, in, in the project, it's because there is no European uh, geological survey. So we grouped, uh, we use this group of uh, geological surveys and they've been doing a very good job at uh, compiling data at the European scale, which is a challenge in Europe. Um, we've got a work package too, uh, so it is led by CO2 Geonet. We've got a work package too led by Geostock, um, looking at uh, reservoir engineering uh, questions and, uh, and abiotic uh, geochemistry uh, questions. Um, so reservoir engineering, because we want to use the data collected in work package one, which is a static to recall data, uh, to build capacity estimates of, uh, of each uh, storage capacity estimate for each of the trap in World Package 2. Um, in World Package 3, uh, we are working um, on the, the, the microbiological activity impact uh, when we store hydrogen in depleted fields and aquifers. Uh, many of you uh, probably know uh, that it's, it's, um, it's a very active field of research today. Um, a lot of uh, projects and people, researchers, are working on that. In high stories, um, the origin originality maybe is that we have a quite large sampling program. Uh, we want to collect uh, uh, brine samples with their own uh, microbiological uh, fauna from a dozen of sites in Europe uh, of, on, of natural gas storage sites in porous media not in the idea of analyzing this site for a possible conversion to hydrogen, but in the idea of having uh, populations of bacteria that are kind of representative of various sites that are natural gas sites today, but that could have been in other conditions in another world selected as hydrogen storage sites. So that's why we have such a large number or so of uh, advisory board uh, members. Um, we have then a World Package 4, so it's led by MicroPro. Uh, we then have a World Package 4 um, led by University of Leoben, 
uh, working on uh, the qualification of steel materials uh, for uh, for the, the well completions of hydrogen storages. And then we are done with what we are doing uh, on the technology development side. The other part of the project is the uh, techno-economic feasibility studies on the right of your screen in, in, in uh, green. So here we consider both uh, salt caverns and uh, porous storages because uh, excluding salt caverns would kind of uh, bias as the analysis we could draw um, on underground storage of hydrogen. So we have a work package for five uh, led by LBST. Uh, they are working on the energy system of Europe, uh, modeling it and introducing underground storage of hydrogen as a, as a buffer to match as each time step energy production and energy uh, consumption in Europe. And this is used to, to uh, estimate uh, uh, the storage uh, demand uh, each, in each uh, EU27 uh, plus UK countries. We have a work package six uh, led by FHA um, that have uh, worked on uh, making a, a review of the regulation at the European scale. We have a work package seven uh, led by Geostock uh, we have worked on uh, building cost estimates of developing a, a, a new underground storage site of hydrogen. And last, we have a work package 8 laid by FHA, uh, working on uh, several case studies. Um, so I will briefly present these work packages that are quite advanced. The works that I will present are, are mostly finished. Um, and uh, leave uh, the work that are not finished yet uh, for maybe a next webinar. Um, <clears throat> so on the work package one, we are building first on uh, past works, European funding works, uh, um, CO2 stop and SMAP, just like High Stories is also EU funded from Clean Hydrogen GU. Um, the database is organized uh, with three layers formations, storage units, and traps. Um, so um, what um, formation is, is at the basin, sediment, sedimentary basin uh, level. And what we really look at uh, for the storage, um, future storage is, is a trap structure. Uh, so there are 900 uh, traps that have been uh, identified in this database. Uh, UCs, uh, UCs them uh, on the GIS on the right. Um, and then uh, for each of them, uh, they, have, they come with, uh, with several attributes and we tried to include uh, in the list of attributes uh, what could be relevant for hydrogen storage. Uh, so we tried to enhance the databases that did exist with, for instance, more information on geochemistry, of the of the water or brine that is present in the reservoir, uh, etc. And it has been populated at best uh, of the knowledge of the seventeen partners from CO two Geonet and subcontractors uh, to cover uh, more than twenty or twenty five countries. On a World Package two, uh, we are using uh, this database and um, using it to uh, to draw an estimation of the capacity, uh, uh, storage capacity for each of the 900 traps. So to doing that, we use a conceptual synthetic model. It's a simplified uh, ellipsoid uh, uh, made uh, in Petrel. Uh, we don't have the real geometry, of course, uh, but we use this geometry uh, with a minimum set of parameters, but the key, the key ones, era, thickness, porosity, and depth for each of the 917 traps. Uh, we use hydrogen free uh, uh, properties and we use that to estimate the capacity of uh, the trap. Um, so it's of course not the real geometry, but we compared this approach with uh, three uh, real uh, uh, reservoir models uh, from three existing natural gas storage sites. And we compare the result in terms of storage capacity. That's what you see in the middle. And we found that it's uh, very close. So it was satisfying this approach. Uh, it was applied to all the traps of uh, the, the WP1 database <coughs> and uh, in the static uh, for, in, for static models. 
and it has been now also applied uh, with uh, dynamic simulations uh, for more than 20 uh, traps. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is the result. Uh, so you see the size of the dot here um, is uh, the storage capacity that is found applying this, uh, this uh, ellipsoid uh, simplified models on each of the 900, on each of the 900 traps. And, um, and uh, you see the, in the location of the, uh, the center of the dot, of course, is the location of the trap. Um, so on work package uh, three, um, on, um, on the microbiological questions, um, we know that hydrogen is a strong uh, electron donor, and it, uh, it is an attractive source of energy for uh, numerous reactions. But in abiotic uh, conditions, without life, um, these reactions are stopped from happening um, under 200 degrees C uh, due to kinetics uh, reasons. So basically, they do not happen in our uh, reservoir conditions, uh, in abiotic conditions. But uh, there are some uh, bacteria that are able to use these thermodynamically possible reactions uh, for their own uh, metabolism. Um, and uh, doing that, uh, they, they make the reaction happen and they convert part of the hydrogen to other products. Um, <clears throat> so this, um, this, is, uh, this is also strongly, so there are three main families of uh, microorganisms that are a concern for uh, underground storage of hydrogen. Uh, methanogens, sulfite, sulfate reducing, and acetogens. And uh, it's also very uh, related to the availability of carbonates and sulfates uh, in the formation water. <clears throat> so the approach of uh, high series, as said, it relies on a sampling uh, of uh, 11 uh, storage facilities. So this have been, this have been done. So you see here uh, the, the, the list and the main uh, characteristics uh, of the sites that have been sampled. So there is a diversity of sites, both depleted fields and aquifers. Um, each of these samples have been characterized. So you have you have the list here of the characterizations that have been done by MicroPro. Um, in each of the eleven samples, but one, um, the families uh, sulfate reducing, methanogen, and acetogen. The three families of bacteria have been found. You see that on the graph uh, on, on the right. Um, and then uh, using these, um, these um, formation waters, um, we, uh, we, drew, we, we uh, do um, hydrogen consumption tests. So the, the formation water are enriched uh, to increase the number of uh, microorganisms in it. And then uh, they are, are put in reactors under high pressure and also at atmospheric or more or less atmospheric pressure uh, with or without uh, additional carbon sources, etc. And the goal, uh, but it is an ongoing work today, is to use the results for uh, investigation of uh, the, the main uh, factors affecting this uh, microbial activity, carbon sources, salinity, sulfate concentration, temperature, etc. So this is the work of World Package 3. On World Package 4, we work on, um, on <coughs> uh, we want to evaluate uh, what steel grades can be used for uh, tubing and casing <coughs> of underground gas storages. Uh, because hydrogen is uh, raising questions that do not exist uh, with uh, conventional oil and gas uh, applications, uh, mostly due to the, the capacity of, of hydrogen permeation into the the crystal of the of the, of the metal, um, which creates some uh, embrittlement and blistering um, effects. Uh, so it's also um, largely based on an experimental approach. Um, its tests are mostly conducted at University of Leuven. Um, Twelve steel grades have been selected. You have the list here. They are um, they are oil and gas uh, type of, of steel grades. Um, a test conditions uh, for test for uh, gases uh, on, on have been uh, selected uh, for the test conditions that could be found in underground storages. Two temperatures have been defined, 
Uh, it's also tests are done with or without the presence of uh, liquid uh, electrolytes, uh, which can be uh, saline or not. So at the end, we've got like more than 250 tests uh, um, in the in the in the in our program. Uh, test being uh, autoclave testing, uh, and uh, then we test uh, the tensile stress. Um, uh, so the autoclave uh, with the sample under tensile stress. And then we analyze the cracking and whether there was corrosion on the sample uh, and whether there was uh, a hydrogen uptake in the sample. Uh, permission test also done after the test. Uh, <clears throat> so from these uh, constant load tests, uh, main results uh, we have as, are that uh, materials, all of them but one, show no fracture under uh, tested conditions. I will get back to the one that had uh, some fractures. Um, uh, there is nearly no uptake without H2S. There is some uh, when there is a presence of H2S in, uh, in our gas, but uh, it is uh, relatively low. Uh, so the cracking occurs only with a quench L80 uh, steel, but quench L80 is not used for tubing and casing. It is known to be very sensitive to hydrogen, and it was act actually included in the program uh, uh, to, 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 to check that we would observe something um, uh, with uh, sensitive materials, and we did. Uh, so it, it is highlighting the relevance of the methodology that, that we've been conducting. So now, uh, why is in industry in this question of, of steel grades for hydrogen applications? Um, where are the main man built structure of an underground storage? And uh, it relies a lot on standardization from the API, uh, American Petroleum Institutes, uh, developed by and for the oil and gas industry. It is not directly applicable to hydrogen. And hydrogen is raising new questions. We saw that, that these questions of uh, embrittlement. And uh, while there are standards for surface, uh, for different reasons, they cannot be really applied uh, to underground conditions. So uh, we, we face, and our industry faces, a lack of standard for, for designing hydrogen uh, wells, uh, wells or hydrogen service. So we rely on research and development today. We are kind of in a pre-normative approach, and the high stories work is really entering into this frame. And recently, uh, we, have, uh, we had some uh, major manufacturer, uh, Valorec, uh, who published um, uh, his their qualification of uh, material for hydrogen applications, including storage, underground storage. It uh, directly uh, uh, refers to uh, the work that is done in high stories. And so we see that this is moving very fast, uh, very, very fast, and that these research works are already uh, uh, used to bridge, to bridge um, the gap, uh, the knowledge gap we had and the standard gap we had uh, uh, at the industrial scale. So we're quite happy about this uh, dissemination of these uh, research works. So we are done now with the presentation of the technical developments. I will move to the right side of our work program, which is uh, the techno-economic uh, uh, feasibility studies. So here we have both soil caverns and porous storages in the scope. Um, first point is, um, first question we have is, uh, why do we store? Uh, why do we store and how do we store? So um, if we look at kind of closed industries, um, we see that for CO2 geological storage, we store for avoiding uh, greenhouse uh, effects. And we want it to be stored at least 10,000 years and never withdraw it. Uh, oil, it is stored on the ground today uh, for geopolitical reasons and typically uh, story, typical storage duration is three years. Natural gas, uh, it has been stored initially uh, to cope for the high seasonality in demand. Uh, also more recently for trading reasons and uh, with the, 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 the tension we have now and the Ukraine war, uh, it may be uh, very relevant to for uh, geo geopolitical reasons. Uh, but historically, uh, it is still the seasonality of demand that is driving this uh, industry, and it is mostly seasonal storage. And uh, LPG and hydrogen, um, it is used and stored on the ground today 
as a buffer and a feedstock for um, for uh, various industries, petrochemical industries mostly. And typically it is sometimes unused for years and uh, used then uh, very rapidly to, to, to because a, a plant is in maintenance or sometimes it is used in a weekly basis. It, it, it is a lot of uh, different conditions. Um, so this is an example of a typical uh, storage cycle in a natural gas storage site. Uh, we see a clear seasonal uh, pattern of the storage. This is an example of um, the hydrogen storage in uh, in a salt cavern in uh, in Texas by early kid, and it was steady uh, over more than one year when the storage stored started. It was full, and then <coughs> it was emptied in less than a year. Um, so the question is, uh, how long, uh, what will be the cycle for green hydrogen? What are the drivers? Uh, it depends whether you consider it's power to power, power to gas, power to mobility that will be driving the demand. And uh, we want to know, to have an idea of the storage, we need to design uh, what is the cycles and what is the size of the, of the demand for storages. So we kind of uh, fall short with our intuition. And uh, when intuition is not enough, uh, we can rely on, on modeling here. It is what is done uh, by LBST in uh, high stories. So they have defined uh, different scenarios of uh, deployment of the, of the uh, energy uh, systems in Europe uh, until 2050. Uh, they have modeled the European energy system, so each at each time step, which is one hour, they match energy production and energy demand um, at the European uh, level. Uh, energy production with the inclusion of renewables, according to the scenarios, and uh, they introduced energy uh, hydrogen storage as a buffer, and they minimize the overall cost of the system, and this uh, minimal cost and gives us the cycles we can expect for each of the countries. So this is just an example of what we get uh, for France in two scenarios. So you find here mostly seasonal cycles. It is what we find in most of the countries. Um, we also have as a result um, the optimal uh, volume capacity for hydrogen storage in EU27 and UK. So for the three time steps we had defined, uh, you have here uh, the storage demand as found by this model optimization uh, for each of the countries. So here you've got the sum of all countries uh, for uh, both salt caverns and porous media. And uh, so we have it for, uh, per country. So this is for one of the scenario in, uh, in one of the time step 2050. Uh, so we have here uh, the storage uh, demand in either porous media or salt caverns. Uh, for the for the each of the EU twenty seven uh, countries and UK. So these are the big results um, we have to date uh, with World Package five. Um, on World Package six, uh, we worked on the uh, on doing a regulatory review of uh, European um, uh, legislation. It was done by FHA. Uh, they relied. It's difficult because the regulations are national. Uh, languages uh, vary a lot, of course, and uh, it's not easy to tackle uh, when you enter the topic. And so um, it, it relied a lot on a survey, and uh, we thank here uh, all the repliers, the respondents to the survey, uh, mostly from CO2GNet and from uh, our advisory board. And based on that, um, FHA, pro FHA proposed um, uh, this analysis, the table on the right, of the readiness of the regulation for each of these countries. And we also provide more detailed tables for four countries, uh, France, Germany, Spain, and Poland, based on uh, more detailed um, answers from uh, industrials from these countries. Um, so this is public. Um, so in World Package 7, um, we wanted first to answer a question we often get which is how much does underground hydrogen storage cost? Difficulty is that underground storage is very case specific, uh, more or less as any uh, geology related activity. Uh, you see on the left, uh, different, very different shapes for soil caverns, different depths. 
on the right, a uh, very different kind of uh, reservoirs. So uh, we uh, used an approach of first defining clearly um, uh, typical designs, what we call conceptual designs of hydrogen underground storages. And then uh, we did a kind of project based uh, and a bottom up um, cost estimate of the, of the storage for this conceptual design. Uh, it enables us to know the design and the boundaries of the cost estimate, uh, which is rare, rare to find. It enables us to have a parametric model uh, to distinguish uh, storage's uh, cost associated to the storage capacity and cost associated to the withdrawal, the flow rate capacity of the site, and to make it H2 specific. So for salt caverns, which is uh, largely, largely engineered, we relied on a typical engineering of the cavern uh, and um, on re reasonable assumptions for depths of the soil deposits, typically. For porous storages, um, which is more uh, relying on uh, the, the porous trap that can be found, it is uh, based uh, first on an analogy with, um, with the European uh, natural gas storages using IGU database. And, uh, and we took these uh, typical uh, properties of, of traps that are used for natural gas storage and applied that um, as, a, as a base case um, and, uh, and, to, and, and draw and developed uh, our cost model uh, based on that. So at the end, we've got uh, typical cases uh, and we, we, at each time we have low, mid and high cases um, for these two kinds of storages. And we developed the cost model and gives us, so the overall cost in euro per megawatt hour, so euro per storage capacity unit. Um, and uh, in uh, also the surface cost in euro per megawatt, so in euro per power or per flow rate uh, unit. Um, so it gives us this, uh, these overall numbers for both solar caverns and porous media. Um, typically, as an order of magnitude uh, for the mid cases, uh, for both technologies, uh, the capex, for instance, is about two euro per normal cubic meter of storage capacity. And these are the numbers we used in the energy model uh, I presented you before uh, of World Package Five. It gives us also something else, uh, which is a, a parametric cost model. So this is just an example. Uh, the cost uh, is it can be um, can depend on a number of parameters that we thought were relevant, and we keep them we kept them as inputs, and uh, we are applying this parametric model to the trap properties that were defined in World Package One, and this will enable us to uh, estimate the levelized cost of storage uh, for these traps. So this is ongoing work. Um, to conclude, I presented you an introduction to the results. Uh, it's a big project, it's difficult to present that in half an hour. So please uh, go to the source report that I mentioned in each of the slides uh, to have more detailed um, detailed explanations of the, of, the, of the work and of the frame of the work. Um, <clears throat> some, um, we see that some of high studies results already have some industrial applications, uh, like the recommendation for steel grades uh, so it's it's a very good um, very good uh, thing for the project and for the industry. Um, we are at a big half of the project. Uh, we still have results that are uh, and works that are ongoing, and uh, major conclusions will be drawn only at the end of the project. So probably uh, mid uh, next year, we will have a final conference at the end of the of the project. Uh, so if you are interested to attend, please uh, contact me and email me. And the last, uh, our project um, is public funded by the European Union, by the Clean Hydrogen EU. Uh, most, or about all of the results uh, will be public and will be published on highstories.eu. So please uh, do not hesitate to visit our website. Uh, so we thank uh, our funder, uh, the FJGU, or Clean Hydrogen GU now. And, um, and I thank you for uh, listening to this webinar. And please ask uh, questions. Do not hesitate to ask questions.
Thank you very Thank much, you. Arnold, for this extremely informative and fascinating talk. Uh, uh, we see already plenty questions posted. Uh, so without any further ado, I uh, give the floor to Sebastian. Okay. Yeah. Thank you much for me as well, uh, Arno, and really informative and interesting talk. And as Hadi said, um, there are literally countless questions um, in the, from the audience, which shows how much interest there is on hydrogen storage. So start with sort of perhaps the, the questions on the mind of many of us, which one of the last questions that came in from Sai Janga. When do you expect implementation of a large scale underground hydrogen storage system in porous media in Europe, even a pilot? Um, so a pilot, uh, a pilot. I know there are some um, that are underway in porous media, too, as far as I know. Uh, there are also more than that uh, in salt caverns. Uh, there are pilots in Europe. Uh, what I observe um, is that in in, in the US, uh, there are industrial scale. Uh, it's more in salt caverns, but but projects too. Uh, for underground hydrogen storage. But the, there's forest media pilots, like the underground sun storage one, that's not 100% hydrogen, that's a mix between hydrogen and town gas. So I think what Zaid was wondering is 100%, so just pure hydrogen storage. Um, and... Yes, uh, the, the sun project is, is, is um, that has been done and in, uh, in, in, in quite in, ad, in advance for uh, uh, porous media uh, storage pilots. Uh, is uh, is 10% uh, hydrogen, as you said, uh, but they, they announced, uh, RAG announced that they are working on a pilot. I think it's uh, it's um, Sun 3000, maybe, um, a project of pure hydrogen storage uh, in a reservoir. Thank you. Um, talking about so the storage, there's a lot of interest around storage and storage capacity. So. Marcia Bono, you can actually see just sitting behind Hardy there, I think. Um, yes, thank you for the, hey Marcia, <laughs> thank you for the nice presentation. CO2 and hydrogen will be stored in the same subsurface. Is, is this taken into account in the hydrogen storage capacity estimation? Um, so here um, you, you, you're um, raising the um, idea of competition of use of the pore space um, it's not directly taken into account in uh, in high stories but i'm not sure that we've got such a strong competition personally uh, we are in, in underground storage uh, we are looking at uh, much smaller uh, capacities than for co2 jury core storage yes. uh, we are injecting and withdrawal and withdrawing uh, we are not uh, permanently uh, injecting uh, CO2. We do not want to be that to do that. So we are looking at uh, smaller traps uh, at high in injectivity uh, ones, but not not necessarily the, the very large uh, large scale uh, aquifers. For instance, we could be looking at for CCS. Okay. And last, sorry, last. If sorry. we compare the capacity we have uh, from our capacity estimate and the demand uh, that we estimated uh, with LBST, there is a still a lot of margin. Um, Xavier has a similar, no, no, similar question, but he also wonders about uh, the storage. And he says, um, do you attempt to store hydrogen coming from different or or origins, green versus gray, across distinct identified reservoirs? Or are you going to mix different um, hydrogen gases of different origins? Um, so on the technical uh, question, we don't really look at whether it's green or gray. Uh, it's a hydrogen molecule. Um, and um, on, on the, uh, for instance, on the storage demand uh, estimations, we looked only at green hydrogen. Hydrogen is only uh, related to the to the uh, production of uh, it, it's produced uh, using electricity through electrolysis and electricity is coming from uh, renewable uh, renewable energy sources uh, wind and pv so we only looked at uh, green hydrogen production uh, in high stories it was the frame of the call and the frame of the project 
Thank you. Um, Mengie Zhao has two questions and one, so thanking you for the really nice presentation, the first question, and um, is really amazed about the digital map that you've created. She wonders if this digital map is available for public and how much detailed data does this map include? Do we see, for example, heterogeneity or nearby faults? So what level of detail is there in the map? So the, um, the map and the results of high series in general will, will be public. <laughs> and um, But whether it will include um, uh, presence of faults, um, it will, uh, it will, the presence of fault, for instance, is uh, one of the, of, of the attributes of the database of, so for each of the 900 traps. Then uh, the information is not there for all of them, but uh, for many of them, it, it, the presence or not is there and, um, and it will be public. Great. Thank you. Um... Let's see. So, yeah, there's so many questions to ask. So one is here from Kurt Oldenburg. Uh, it says, is your seasonal use case based on converting all of the withdrawn hydrogen to electricity or is there a direct use component, for example, blending it with natural gas? It is considering um, different uses. Um, it, it is considering um, hydrogen um, use for, uh, for power, uh, for, for, for electricity. It is using, uh, it is considering hydrogen use for the industry, for mobility. So all of these uses are defined and are, are in uh, LBST uh, modeling. Um, and all of them are, um, are possible. And I think that from what I remember, um, uh, hydrogen use for reinjection of natural gas in natural gas is not what is uh, really, uh, uh, I mean, developing. We, we are more, to, more uh, looking at hydrogen uh, uh, use for mobility and industry. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of your simulations, it's quite a detailed question from the JAS HC. I'm sorry, I don't know what, what your full name is. How do you define the hydrogen properties in your dynamic workflow? Um, it mix hydrogen mixed with existing gas, it shares an interface with brine, for example, relative permeability and capillary pressures. What what kind of data do you use there? Um, so I think it's pure hydrogen for hydrogen properties uh, uh, li like viscosity, uh, for uh, two-phase flow uh, properties like uh, capillary pressure or or uh, or uh, relative uh, permeability. It is um, it is I think um, uh, typical um, uh, values for the reservoirs that are used. Zaid has another interesting question. It says, um, what's the main characteristic that distinguishes a hydrogen storage trap from any other trap, say CO2 storage? Um, so from CO2 st storage, probably the capacity, we're not really looking at the same thing. Uh, we are looking at much higher uh, capacities for CO2 storage. We also want it to be super critical, so more than 700 meters uh, deep depths. Uh, which is not uh, not a criteria for hydrogen. Uh, but then, I mean, if we compare uh, hydrogen uh, storage and natural gas storage, um, traps would be essentially similar. Some there are some differences. Hydrogen is more mobile, uh, more more less viscous, more fingering. Um, so you may store less uh, uh, in the same uh, trap. Uh, because of that, you've got this uh, uh, more uh, prone to microbiological activity, as said. Uh, so you may prefer uh, traps where you have uh, no carbonates or no sulfate. But um, essentially, um, it would be similar traps. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take here a question from Marty again and combine this with another of the questions. So she asked, does the energy system optimization include only renewable energy sources and storage, or does it also include non-renewable energy sources and CCS? She also says um, that to ask if the gas network is in Europe is certified for um, hydrogen transport. Do you agree with that assessment? Um. 
So again, as far as I I am uh, I remember where LBST work, and I refer I would I would rely on them to correct and uh, and and I will. If you want detail, you may refer to their reports. Uh, but as far as I um, know, their works. Um, they also, um, I mean, I'm sure they also have on, uh, non green um, en energy sources. Uh, we also have, for instance, uh, nuclear production in the model. Um, I, but I don't think we have CCS. Okay. We don't. Take two more questions here. Um, one maybe perhaps slightly easier to answer than the, the next one. Um, so, Xavier also on. Wonders how do you evaluate the volume of a salt covering formed by dissolution and leaching? Um, in the approach we had, uh, we uh, we designed it. Um, we designed it by uh, proposing a typical design of a salt cavern. Actually, it's three cases: a low, mid, and high case. Um, and um, and so it was the geometrical uh, volume was. Design and, and designing um, salt cavern is is something we typically do uh, uh, at Geostock. Okay. And then the last question, but certainly not the least one, um, from Florian Doster says: Social acceptance often critical in such projects. See the CCS example in Germany. Do you have any experience now? Public would respond after all H two can be explosive. Um, um so it's true that uh, h2 can be explosive um co2 is not uh, but there is no oxygen in the engram um we we are working on that uh, but it's ongoing work led by fha there will be a, a, a public survey uh, sent out in throughout europe there will be also uh, um, another survey sent to stakeholders um but there is, um, do we have experience? Uh, well, at industrial scale, uh, uh, they are our first experience of hydrogen uh, underground storage on in salt cavern, but from a public acceptance point of view, I'm not sure that would, there would be a big difference. Um, last one uh, that has been commissioned in, in Texas by Ali Kid is uh, only a decade old. So not that, it's not that far away. And um, and um, I'm not aware of uh, of of public acceptance questions related to that. And I also uh, refer here to the, to the experience in developing uh, natural gas underground storage. And I observe that uh, many new storages have been commissioned uh, in Europe. Uh, I mean, over the last uh, decade. Uh, I mean, uh, suits vending in the Netherlands, uh, whole form of Stublash in the UK. Um, uh, so new caverns um, in, in France uh, for so it's for liquid storage. So many countries um, in in porous media in Italy also um, in Cornigliano. So there are examples of new storages of uh, of uh, uh, natural gas in Europe recently, and I would mostly ex uh, expect that um, hydrogen storage. Uh, finds the same uh, situation as, as a natural ga gas underground storage and that it would, um, of course, uh, it has to be uh, uh, considered, uh, but I, I do not expect that it would stop this industry from developing. I think we need this uh, industry to develop for other reasons, okay. climate change, uh, security of supply, etc. Great. Well, Arno, thank you very much for a really nice talk. Um, thank you to our audience for lots and lots of really good good questions. Um, I think we had many, many viewers online, so don't be surprised if you get requests for attending your final closeout conference of the High Stories Project. With that, um, Hardy, over to you for some final comments. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Arno, and also uh, Sebastian, all the uh, participants, all the many participants, and many who would just shortly are waking up also across the Atlantic and other places to watch uh, Arnold's talk uh, in a moment. Uh, so I'd like to also explain that uh, next uh, we have changed uh, our webinars from weekly based webinars after two years running it constantly now to monthly based webinars with distinguished speakers. Now we had the pleasure and honor to host Arnold as the first one in the series of monthly based webinars. 
the next speaker will be from Rock Austria, and <clears throat> and the speaker will explain about the Sun projects and all the activities that Rock has, and we actually had discussed it right now. Arnold also mentioned about their former projects in 2015 and the one that is for the pure hydrogen, about two million cubic meters of hydrogen to be purely stored. So with that, I'd like to thank you all, especially our speaker, despite being extremely busy accepting our invitation and sharing his insight on this amazing project of high stories. I call it his stories. You need to forgive me for that. It's high stories, perhaps the best pronunciation. But we also look forward to receiving the invitation for the conference at the end of the project. So to engage with you and all the team members that have done all these various projects from material science to economics to all these uh, techno economics and reservoir performance. Thanks once more and have a nice week ahead and goodbye. Thank you all for listening and asking questions. Thank you, Adi and Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.